Good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. What a beautiful day for the first day of the year. We've uh, been in Revelation. A lot of people are listening online, and a lot of people are getting CDs and <clears throat> try to uh, keep moving and not get too bogged down as we get into Revelation 9 uh, this evening. In uh, Revelation, and let's, I guess we need to kind of try and review a few things as we go through this to kind of keep us, uh, kind of keep us fresh in what we've been doing. I know it's hard to, week to week, kind of keep it in your head, and it is for me too. Uh, we looked at the different views of the book of Revelation. Of course, we're looking at this as a preterist view, the idea that this has taken place already for the most part, which I believe is probably true. There's four things we've talked about we need to keep in mind. The scroll we looked at, beginning of this, is Christ's eternal purpose for man's redemption. Only Christ can open it, and it is the revelation of the purpose. In other words, it's what's revealing it to us as we open it up. The seals, we pulled the seals, we were getting a revelation of it. No person in this whole vision is identified as a living character. No specific historical event is disclosed. No definite point in time is recorded. And that's something that if you look at prophetic books like, especially like Daniel, Daniel has specific points in history where he said, this is the start. This is what's going to happen. The time of the issue of the decree to rebuild the temple. Jeremiah, the same thing, 71 years, the book of Jeremiah. So a lot of Old Testament prophecy has specific points in time where things were going to happen. Revelation doesn't have that. So we must rely on the assurance that things which must shortly come to pass, the general period of the church is beginning. Uh, there's symbols and symbolic pictures, and we've talked about that a lot, what it says, what it means. Um, we have to look at that continually as we look at this book. Numbers, what do numbers mean? What do symbols mean? What does different illustrations mean? And we've talked about that a lot. It was kind of funny. Keith told me uh, he was at a, some sort of a bank deal or something, and people that were there from overseas, and they'd said something about for lunch they were going to have chicken wings. And one of the guys was with him afterwards, took him out, and he says, are you going to have buffalo wings? And the guy took him out afterwards, and he said, uh, buffaloes don't have wings. <laughs> what are buffalo wings? <laughs> so, you know, things that seem simple when we know what they mean, if we've never heard it before, it makes it difficult to understand. And that's, of course, the case with Revelation a lot of times. It says, visions are being interpreted, things that are not physically possible. As we see in the book of Ezekiel and the opening of the seals, each one revealing something. So it's not literal. You know, I think we have to understand that. Almost nothing in this book is a literal interpretation. It's not things that are, li that are, that are literal. Now, as we talked about this, you have seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. I didn't put that up there tonight, but we need to remember that. And after the sixth seal, we had an interlude, the breaking of the seventh seal. That's the beginning of the trumpets. And then we have the trumpets. And after the sixth trumpet, we'll have an interlude. And then we'll have a seventh trumpet. So the last seal introduced the, the trumpets. The last trumpet introduced the bowls. So the seals, where we looked at first, that's kind of the revelation. The trumpets are the sounding, are the warning. And the bowls will be the power, the judgment. So that's how Revelation plays out. We looked at Revelation 7 last time. And as we did, we began to see uh, the opening, or Revelation 8, the beginning of these things. And if we look at those first four trumpets we looked at last time, it was about the earth, the sea, the inland water, and the heavens. So the first four warnings, and all of them were a third. And we talked about numbers which means none of that's complete. It's not the end of the world. It's not a complete obliteration. It's limited. It's a third. So it's limited. And it's going to be things against the earth, the sea, the waters, and the heavens, signs that they should be able to see that say something's coming. You need to repent. You need to turn back to God. And these were against the earth. But as we get into the sixth, the, the sixth and the seventh trumpet, we or the fifth and the sixth trumpet, I should have there, the fifth and the sixth trumpet, then we begin to see other things that are going to come against Rome that is supposed to tell them or move them towards the idea 
that they need to repent, they need to turn towards God, which of course they're not, which of course we know they're not going to do. Uh, they're not going to do that. Um, so we begin to see this fifth trumpet. And in this fifth trumpet, we're going to see a star that has fallen. We're going to see, and so we have to ask ourselves, who is this star that has fallen? Is it an entity? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Um, how are we supposed to know that? So I'm going to read to you about the fifth trumpet. Then the fifth trumpet, fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth nor any green thing nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the face of men. And they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings like the wind of chariots. Of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails as their power to hurt men for five months. They have his king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek his name is Apollon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. So, sounds pretty scary. Boward in his great, great planet Earth, he said the locusts were cobra helicopters. So, you know, if you try to take this literal, you try to put some sort of literal meaning on things that you can't put a literal meaning on. If you think back to the previous trumpets that harmed the earth, all these things that are happening, be it darkness, be it locusts, be it all these different things, are things that happen, basically re replicate the plagues against Egypt, if you really look at it that way. And to the Jew, that's what that would have been. What happened to Egypt in order for Pharaoh to finally turn towards God? It's kind of a replicant of these things, a parallel to it, if you want to look at it that way. Is it literal? No, it's not literal. The first four trumpets were against the earth, third of the sea, third of the land. The next two trumpets are going to be against men, but only against the men of the earth, not against men of God. We see that because it said the men who were sealed would not be harmed. These are things to make them repent and to turn. The star here is Satan that has a key to the bottomless pit, the star who fell from heaven. Now, the bottomless pit is not to be confused with hell. Hell in the Bible is Gehenna, and that would be the, what burned outside of Jerusalem. That was Jesus' always, only, always the reference Jesus used to hell. The pit here, the bottomless pit, is the abyss. You see that in the Gospels with Legion, the demon-possessed man. Do you remember that? The man called Legion that was demon-possessed, and he appealed to Jesus, don't cast us into the abyss. The abyss is a place for demons and fallen angels and heavenly beings. It's their hell, if you want to look at it that way. And here, Satan has been granted the key or the ability to loose things out of there. And it's darkness, which is the opposite of light. He gives a key, which is a symbol of power. That, but he came from heaven, so God allowed him, gave him the power to do it. The abyss, don't confuse with Gehenna. The smoke and the locusts did not hurt the earth. Are those sealed by God? This is simply against them. Once again, we look at numerology. Here, the case of five. Five is a very incomplete number, so this is not going to be a long period of time. Rome will begin to experience the payment of their unrighteousness. They will begin to see it. We know historically this happens. This is conflict from within Rome, not from without. If you look at the history of Rome, emperors killed emperors, people killed people, power was switched, things were divided. There was a lot of internal conflict within the Roman Empire. 
Um, if I were to put up a list of emperors, which maybe I should do, you can see that they went through a lot of emperors in Rome. Uh, some of them only were in there for a couple of months before they were either killed or something happened to them. Conflict was rampant. There was a lot of internal conflict, and that's what this is talking about. And it's darkness, and they should see it, but unfortunately, they don't. The next trumpet, the sixth trumpet, is external conflict, the army from the east. Now, in a lot of books that take Revelation literal, or premillennialist books like Valverde and, and others, they take the army to the east to be China, from the Euphrates we'll look at. But is that really true? Probably not. I know it's not. But let's look at the sixth angel. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who have been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released, so that they would kill a third of mankind. And the number of the armies of the horsemen were 200 million, and I heard the number of them, and I saw... This is how I saw in the vision, like horses and those who sat on them, the riders and breastplates, the color of fire, and the hyacinth and the brimstone. The heads of the horse were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads. With them they do harm. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of the gold and silver and brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. So the next trumpet is external. Rome had a lot of external enemies, and they were at war and eventually would be conquered by those enemies. As we know, Rome would fall. And a lot, the reason we talk about the river Euphrates just doesn't mean much to me and you. We look at it literal like to the east. But to the Jew, the river Euphrates, that's where the Assyrians attacked from and it's where the Babylonians attacked from. So to say from the great river Euphrates to a Jew, it meant something. That's where the armies always attacked Jerusalem from, always attacked God's people from. So he's saying that's where these angels had been placed that are going to do this and that this was going to happen and it was going to be external. It's the easternmost boundary of the Roman Empire, and they'll be attacked from outside their borders. And it's interesting, if you look at 9, especially here, is that it's past tense. Did you notice that? It says they did not repent. So he's saying these things have kind of already are taking place. This is already occurring. It's a past tense, not current. They didn't do it. It's not going to say they would not do it. He said they did not do it, which I think is very interesting in the text. And it says, the smoke and locusts did not hurt the earth, or those sealed by God. So now we see, in these first six of the seventh trumpet, we're going to have an interlude again. And then the seventh trumpet will sound. And the seventh trumpet will get us to the seven bowls. Okay? So these trumpets are warnings. Warnings to men to repent, to turn to God. Warnings that are physical, the earth, the sea, the rivers, the water, and then warnings that are internal within their empire and warnings that are external aggression without of their empire. Things that they should see and see that God is in control, that things are going to change. They should repent, but the scripture says they did not repent. And because of their lack of repentance, now the bowls are going to be poured forth on the earth. The bowls, which is actually going to be the demonstration of the power, pulled forth across the earth. So as we begin to unfold this, I've been trying to go slow. So just remember, right, we got seven seals, revelation, seven trumpets, annunciation, getting through those. Still didn't repent after the seven trumpets have an interlude, we're going to have another interlude, then we're going to have the seven bowls, okay, that's going to be poured out on the earth. And if you remember from early in Revelation, it says those bowls were the prayers of the saints, right, mixed with fire from the altar. So that's going to be prayer and action. The bowls are going to be poured upon the earth. 
So we've gone through these trumpets of warning, which is natural disasters, internal conflict, external aggression. They're still not going to repent. So now we're going to have another interlude. We're going to be stuck in an interlude for a couple more Sunday nights. Going to have an interlude. And then the seventh trumpet in uh, chapter 11, the seventh trumpet is going to bring us to the seven bowls. So that's where we're at. So I hope I'm going slow enough. I hope it's kind of making sense. Don't try to take it too literal because you can't. You just can't. doesn't make sense if you do. All these things are symbolic. Face of a man. We see that all the time in Scripture. It means that they have knowledge. They have ability. Breastplate. Protection. We see that also in Scripture. You see horses are swift. Scorpions sting. All these things are put together. Lion. We see that. The king of the predators. So we, we see all these different illustrations that mean a lot to them, probably more than us, that is showing us uh, what's going on, telling us what this is about, showing us Satan's role in, in all this. And, the, and then, but once again, as we see that angel coming from heaven, that really shows that even though Satan released those things out of the abyss, he's still under the power of God, still under the control of God. He's not acting independently. God's allowing it. God's allowing it to happen. So a lot of symbolism. Star falling from heaven, right? We talked about Isaiah and Satan falling from heaven. We often use that passage. So a lot of Old Testament tied into this. And that's one thing that really hurts us in the book of Revelation, I think, is we're just not Old Testament people, you know? And so we have a hard time pulling that Old Testament. They were. They understood that better than you and I. That's the reason I keep trying to go back to the Old Testament, trying to pull that up, trying to say, let's look back here to what this meant to them, not to us. We're very low context when it comes to the book of Revelation. They were very high context. We have to catch up. So we in order to do that, we kind of got to pull that Old Testament stuff back in so that we can see. I think Job, I kind of brought this scripture, which maybe it won't make uh, sense to you in this passage, but it did to me. Uh, Job, such a powerful text, Job. Why is light given to him who suffers in life to the bitter soul? You know, these Christians are under such persecution. They're under such um, torment. They're being killed. They're being, all these things are happening to them. You know, Job, I think, really kind of hits it with this. Who long for death, but there is none. And dig for it more than hidden treasures. Who rejoice greatly and exult when they find the grave. Why is light given to these Christians that Jesus just put them here to be persecuted, didn't he? I mean, if you think about it, this is early, right? Second, third century. This is, this is early on. Why did Christ start the church in order that all these Christians would die? Why didn't he tell them to take up arms and fight against Rome and he would wipe Rome off the map? Isn't that the Old Testament God that would say, take up arms and go destroy that nation, destroy them and take the land and take this property and take all this for you? And yet God let them be slaughtered, didn't he, by the millions, by the hands of the Roman emperors, by the hands of the Romans. He let them be slaughtered. They longed for death. They exalted when they found the grave because they knew their persecution on the thirst was so severe. But don't does it make sense? Because God wasn't looking and never will be looking again for a physical kingdom on this earth. If he was looking for that, he would have gave them the means to have fought those Romans and to have been the victor, the earthly victor over the Roman Empire. But the kingdom of heaven did not come with a sword. Did not come with a sword. The kingdom of heaven came with love and submission in the blood of a million martyrs who were slaughtered for the cause of Jesus Christ. That to me is powerful. And yet in spite of that, the kingdom of God still exists. That to me is powerful. You talk about the power of the book of Revelation. You had to put yourself in the place of these people. These people who were maybe wanting death more than life. But the light of Christ was given to them so that it could come to us. And it came to us by their blood and by their sacrifice. Not by a sword. Not by a war. But by their sacrifice. We can never forget that. And why do people take this book to say now Christ is going to come back and make an earthly war in an earthly kingdom? If he was going to do that, why didn't he do it here? Why didn't he do it here? Why did he wait 
2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000 years? And why did all those Christians have to die and be murdered and slaughtered because of their faith in Jesus Christ? Because he's never looking again for an earthly kingdom here. And we preach that the book of Revelation is about an earthly war in an earthly kingdom. Then we, we take away from the power of the gospel and the love and the blood of Jesus Christ and the Christians who died because of his word. He doesn't look for that, and he's still not looking for it. Our kingdom is not here. Our kingdom is there. Thanks for your time this evening.